brothers did it first. And, um, and what he said was, they knew why they were doing it, um, because they, one of them wanted so badly, they wanted to feel like it, what it was like to fly. So every time they crashed and burned, it was just another step to figuring out of why they wanted to do this. So that's kind of... And they knew that wasn't it, but they kept going for it. They knew, like, okay, that one it, it crashed, but they knew... Um, and I guess, I, you know, the way I translated it, that um, in periods as a, like, say as a writer or teacher director, that I felt floundery, um, and there have been a few, that I would think to come back to uh, what I, how I wanted my life to look. And so if it didn't look like that, um, uh, like why, how, why I wanted it to look that way or feel that way on a daily basis, um, it would remind me that, okay, well then you could do this instead. You could try this instead. There's not just one, one avenue to do that. So, anyway. So this, I just want people to think about why. Why, why we do it. And also, can we get the circle so that everybody can be in it who, who wants to be? We got a few people who are in a row too. Is that an empty seat next to you, Tanya? I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. So there's a chair over there if anybody needs it. Aaron, there's a chair by by Tanya. <laughs> Is that Jerry's? Yeah, Jerry's that? It was there when I got it. Okay. All right. So, why? Why? Think about why. Uh, I want to say a little bit about why. I, and part of, uh, I feel like I, I have been pushing toward my own why. And I want to uh, allow for that not to necessarily be the why of the group. But I'm going to keep pushing that way until someone has a different why. Uh, the whole uh, emphasis of this inquiry that is now housed in the um, American Voices New Play Institute that moves to the Emerson for the uh, Center for Theater Commons, uh, it, you know, later on this year, and is really uh, best seen and touched on HowlRound right now. Uh, this is an effort to advance the infrastructure for new work and the people who make it. And it's very, that's a geeky thing to talk about. But if you hear me pushing toward what are we making, what can we make, how can we make it better, what, what, what can we bring into the future, uh, it's because that's what I'm trying to do, is to advance the infrastructure for the work of, uh, the pe and the people who are making it. And so I'm going to probably be more concrete and less poetic in what I'm after um, than some other people might be <laughs> about, about this. But it's a geeky thing uh, that I'm trying, trying to do. Uh, <clears throat> so I cop to that. I've been pushing a little bit uh, throughout the day to get people to think about the field, to think about it on the infrastructure level, to think about the, the future in, in terms that are maybe more concrete than this conversation is comfortable being because it's so much a conversation about ideas, art. It's, that's who we are in the theater anyway. In our, those are our roles. So I know I'm pushing against uh, the comfort zone of, of people. And I appreciate your continuing to indulge me or push back out loud rather than just in corners. Uh, so let, but I do think that over the course of the day, a few things are emerging and I want to throw them out at, for this conversation. Because what I want to try to get to at the end of the day is something that we could write down as a, as a general but helpful guide, a guide more than a, than a recipe for what might bring, we might bring into the next generation of uh, the, to this, to the new millennium, century, whatever. Uh, and so one of the things that I heard this morning was that there is a tremendous amount of reading going on. And yesterday there was a big uh, reaction to Julie's manifesto where she was saying, I would like a database that deals with the pile. I don't actually prioritize having my own pile. I, uh, I, the plays need to be read. If we look at ourselves as a field, is, 
there's a tremendous amount of energy going into this reading. Uh, is there something that could be done about that energy to make it more productive? And I want to talk about that. Uh, I'm also hearing that the sprawl, more after the conversation, uh, when we got the list from Aaron and that breakout group about all the different things and the way it's permeated other conversations, that the sprawl uh, is in the way of what we just talked about at the end of thoughtful time, meaningful time for the dramaturg to be in relationship to the production. Let's use, um, just use Jerry's term for now, even though there are lots of other ways to be in relationship to process. Um, not always ending in production, but let's say that whatever the outcome is, is what we're going to produce and that we should be focused, when we're moving into that, we should be focusing on that as a priority. Uh, that, that the connectivity stuff seems to be taking time, seems to be a big chunk. Willie deals with it, where's John? Willie deals with it by making a separate department. But that stuff is valuable, but it's done uh, by somebody else. Is that something that, that we can talk about? Is that a recommendation? Or do we, is there a way to, to identify time, uh, prioritize time, and those elements of our programming um, align them better than we seem to have them now? Uh, the third thing that, uh, wait, there were, there were, oh, then simply this. How do we get the, uh, this authenticity between the mission and purpose of the, it seems that to be a desire to have an authenticity between the mission, purpose, and processes of our organizations toward the art, uh, and including everything from how we deal with submissions to how we deal with uh, productions and development in the plays, and that this is somehow part of the institutional narrative, it's part of the dr dramaturgical narrative of the organization, and that is in some ways resident to our responsibilities in the literary dramaturgy office. Does that make sense to people as a, did I just make a sentence? Often I don't make a complete sentence and I take, <laughs> and I'm not uh, embarrassed when people point it out. But did that, so that, that sense, that, that authenticity is in some ways the response, is appropriately a responsibility of the literary office to question and, and safeguard? Okay, so thoughts, reactions to all of it, even the why, go ahead and challenge the why. Or don't, you don't have to. Yeah, so I, was, I, I think before you even get to sort of uh, prognosis, or not prognosis, um, you know, uh, suggestions about how we might actually mutate existing systems or, you know, whether there are standards or is there a database that we can share, you have to get to the to an essential um, uh, analysis of who we are in these jobs and why we chose them in the first place. And if you're not the top dog in an institution and you see problems around you and you find yourself unsatisfied by your circumstances, how can you summon the courage to push back? And how can you, how can you try to get a better definition of what the expectations are of you, find out whether your goals and your aesthetics and your assumptions or vision for what the best way to manifest the uh, mission of the theater, uh, whether that all aligns with what the artistic director is thinking. I think a lot of times we operate out of a sense of fear that if we do that too much, we'll be obsolete, or we'll be told our opinion doesn't matter, or we'll be fired and their jobs, jobs are scarce. And in fact, if we are who we say we are, for all, and all the different permutations of that, and we have a kaleidoscopic view of the institution and where it fits in the community, we are the best people to push back against what we see as calcified, or we see as unclear, or we see as a failure to meet a mission, whatever it might be. And, and you know, we've got to take the reins of that. We, we cannot wait for, and, and how that looks in any given, I think, how that looks in any given institutional situation might be different. But we've got to summon that. You know, it, I, I, I'm struck when I, early on, when Mame Hunt was um, just coming into the magic as artistic director, so this is some years ago in, in San Francisco, and she, she came on as the drama, you know, she came out of dramaturgy to be the artistic director, and I asked her, because I worked there as a director quite a bit, I asked her what, um, what defined the dramaturg in her, and she said, 
I'm somebody who's always willing to lose my job for what's right. And, and that she, that somehow, and I think she must have gotten that sense from you, that <laughs> there was nothing more important to fight for than the truth, even if it cost her her job. And how do we get the, as a, as a group of people and as delegates for another larger group of people, how do we find this ground to stand on to say, this is, this is true, even though we're risking. Um, so much of a collaboration is in part, an artistic collaboration is in part reactive. But, but in terms of our professional identities within institutions, they mustn't be, they, they, have, to, they have to be assertive. Not necessarily aggressive, but they have to be assertive. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, don't, you don't build a relationship just by being reactive to mm -hmm. somebody. One thing that I, this, I'm not going to respond to every single thing I promise, but one thing that you remind me is that what comes out of something like this, if we make something come out of something like this, the field does have the habit of following the leaders. And if we can end a little bit with bright spots, we can point to where things are actually working and call that out. And also, nobody wants to be behind the curve. And if something comes of this that is a statement about the future, <laughs> And some of the people in, in some of the institutions decide, yeah, that's right. We're gonna, that's what we're going to move toward. Uh, our, lot, our jobs get a lot easier in standing on that ground and pushing when there's already movement in, in, in that direction. So some of what comes out of this, if we can, if we can clarify it and move it forward, um, it will help that, that. Well, I think, I mean, I totally agree with Christian. I think that. Um, if we, if, the, if we begin to equate professional accomplishment with working at the large institutional theaters, then we doom ourselves to a kind of inefficacy or uh, sort of walking right into the problem of being completely stripped of power. Because I think sometimes our frustrations with large institutions is that they are not nimble the way smaller ones are. And so when we make those choices, we make trade-offs. And I think that those trade-offs are valuable. Right? But I think if we, if we always equate the height of professional accomplishment with working at the big institution, and that's not what suits you as a person, then you're screwed. Right? And, then, and then we get that thing where we're, we aren't courageous. We don't have the willingness to say, I can walk away from my job if it doesn't suit me. Like, if I can't speak truth to power and feel like I'm, I'm doing something positive, then what am I doing there? Why? I, I just feel like a lot of times we shoot ourselves in the foot by staying miserable, mm. you know? And I think we owe ourselves to not stay <coughs> miserable. As Liz says, like, where's your joy? If you can't, if you don't have joy in your work, get out, find something else to do. And I think that thing about scarcity in the profession is really, really rough right now with the economy. Who wants to walk out of a job, right? Especially if that's where you get benefits, if you have childcare that you have to pay for. Like, there's lots of reasons not to leave a job with benefits. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think we have to be more conscious of those trade-offs as we make them. You know, I don't think we can sort of blame the field or blame the institution. I mean, and for sure, blame lies all over the place. But I, I think it's up to us. You know. So, I think it's a lot easier to be afraid, et cetera, et cetera, when you have something concrete to do. So, yes. like, so what are the concrete things? Um, you, like. That we've been talking about. If, if if I hear at the center of a lot of the stuff that we need time to build legitimate relationships, right? But that means, from everything I've heard, that we have to stop doing some stuff. So what do we stop doing? What do we do instead? Like, you know, I'm, you know, I cannot go. I really hope Martha's watching right now. Hi, Martha. I cannot go to Martha and say I need to be happier, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's not good. That's not good. That's not going to get any traction. Uh, but if I have some concrete proposals about how um, how my job duties should be different, that that maybe may, maybe I'll get something. So, what of those things on your list are you going to give up? Um, well, I think I'm going to stop reading plays. <laughs> that would take that could be a lot of time back. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I you know like I think I'm going to you know. And when like, you say that, I want to I want to protect you a little bit, Aaron, from what happened. <laughs> Because <laughs> it wasn't pleasant. Because there's no, there's no reality to that statement, nor is that what's in your heart. But you, what you're saying is the open submission, the 10-page thing, the, all of the time that goes into all of that. Yeah, well, I mean, 
actually, I'm just trying to be a little, you know, a little fun and a little provocative just to get something going, concrete. But I think what what I what I will actually suggest is maybe that um, uh, that I don't read a play by a playwright I haven't met, and that I prioritize first meeting before I write for it. Prioritize first. You had a really great idea in the one breakout of something that you were going to try. Are you, are you sure. Yeah, I've about? been talking about. I couldn't get it together at VG before I left, but um, um, like having um, on the on the website um, a sign up that's completely open, um, and like one Friday a month. I block out half hour increments and any anyone who can get to Steppenwolf can sign up and uh, and you know come in and and that's how I spend a, at least one Friday a month or something instead of instead of uh, reading. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's been talked about. I'm office not the only hours, yeah. yeah, it's some version of office hours. You know, we did we did a thing, we tried to do a little thing like that actually we have a thing that we're doing with the uh, um, with Howl Around oh, we call it knowledge sharing sessions. And the one that I tried, which, you know, I, we, I, because the conversation that I've had 72,000 times or more is the playwright, uh, com the conversation with the playwright about how to make it, how to have a career, you know, that conversation. And, um, and, it, it, and you know, it's legitimate, it's real, and, you know, you, you have to have it all the time. And it, But I thought, God, you know, what if I did it w one night and invited everyone in D.C. who just wanted to have that conversation, and then we also live streamed it. And we had a fair amount of participation, and it was a way for me to actually meet all these DC playwrights who I could never meet, and all these people online, and they were able to ask questions online. We, you know, we live streamed it. We, so just from our end, concretely, we would love to work with you to have some knowledge sharing sessions that might, that could be, a, that could be, you know, like so. What you're saying, we could do that. I mean, we could, we could support something like that, or you know, just throw it out there. I listen. It's only connected to the idea of sharing, but uh, you know, something that came out in another breakout session that, uh, I guess, whatever you were in, um, was the idea of of examining the resources uh, that we have in our institutions that, that we don't necessarily think of as available to playwrights. Uh, um, um, you can come up with better, whoever's in that group would do better with the examples we came up with. But the idea of, of doing a field-wide um, assessment or uh, inventory of, of kind of the, the, the extra capacity we don't even think about we have and then and, and, and sharing that. Um, Madeline, can I ask you, you had a really great way of talking about that this morning, about staying in the reading process at, at Berkeley because you're not sure what else you have really to offer. And, then, and so making the effort to continue reading but make it as authentic as possible. Is it, is it, um, is there, are there other resources that you considered in that that you could offer? Uh, and, and rejected? Is there anything to learn about your process of going through a thinking process and coming back to reading? Well, I, I think we, the way we approached it was thinking about what it would look like if that went away. Uh -huh. and, um, and I think that the thinking behind it was that we as a big regional institution have a reputation for not serving our local community, so it was largely about local playwrights. Mm -hmm. And we, we felt we didn't know how else. I think it was just that we couldn't think of other alternatives. So no, I don't think anything came up that we rejected. We just really honestly couldn't figure out what else to do. And this is actually helpful. Like this idea of office hours I love. And another idea that came up was starting a writer's group and would that be enough? Would that feel like enough access? And we just ended up feeling like anything that was specific to a day or a month or a selection process or a something felt like it wasn't in the right spirit of what we wanted to be. Um, so it's something that I think we will continue to re-examine and think about because we, we do agree with the sentiment that it's yeah. not ideal. Yeah. And it's, it's not, it's, it's fraught. The process is fraught with many things. And yeah. Mm -hmm. No, just wondering if there was value in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I was talking to Alana earlier actually about this, um, uh, a strange story of a baby that we, that sort of uh, surprisingly lived. And Alana started this program, the Huntington Playwriting Fellows, while she was at the Huntington, and then there was complete artistic turnover at, in a one fell swoop when she left and Nikki left, and the producing side of the organization stayed somewhat the same. But um, 
there was, uh, and then Lisa Temmel came on board, who's the director of New Work, and there was real ambivalence about whether we were going to continue this writers group. They'd had a lot of success at producing these people, but we weren't positive going in that we could ever get Peter to pull the trigger on one of them. Um, and what, what would be the point of it? And I think now, this year, we produced two of them, um, two local playwright world premieres by women of color. And um, I think, I was thinking yesterday when Patch was talking about what that ultimately really gave us was a space where voice was all that mattered, the strength of the voice. And um, these are plays that if we were just reading for producing, we may not have pulled out of the stack, but when we were reading just for voice, we fell in love with. And um, I think that was a, in some ways a real gift we gave ourselves of having that space that we couldn't say immediately how it was ever going to tie to our producing. <coughs> um, but I think we're really glad to continue. What's the sense of the room, or, or people who are willing to jump in about it, about some effort towards centralizing the, the knowledge around the plays that are in the pile, the database, the whatever? Yeah. I, I think in that, and I've talked to some people about that, that we first need to prove that there is a whole lot of overlap. Um, and, and if we're ever to consider that we're going to go and, and be so uh, generous with our, our time as to work in this kind of collaborative way, the first step would be for us to, um, to share what list we have and, and, and prove that we do have an overlap and that we have a significant overlap. And I wonder if there's, there's also something of you know, how many readers do we actually identify not only amongst these institutions and all the readers that they have for them, but the readers beyond these institutions. And, and, and out there, and could we actually get a view of the field very practically of the number of playwrights that, that, that were existent in a selection process over 11, 12, um, uh, and the number of readers that were involved in that process as well, to even, to even begin that journey of a centralized. That's a great research project. We should, we should, we should look at that. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. because if we can come up with those numbers, what, how many plays were actually submitted total? and how many readers were involved in that process, that, that would be, that's information we don't currently have, right? Mm -hmm. so nobody here has a solid sense of what that would be. And I think there's, a, there's an anonymity problem there, um, as far as we don't necessarily, I know that, that uh, my artistic directors want to make sure that in some sense our, our lists are private, um, but I do think there are solutions. Which lists? As far as, I, I think this is not, this is not like the selected list, this is not things we're watching, this is just the general this is the, the first round in pool. Um, but, but there are ways that, that we can very quickly and easily um, uh, allow for, for everyone to have some anonymity because it doesn't really matter which institution is getting what name. Um, and, and to build it online, I've, I've got the tools now and we'd we'll be happy to continue. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a lot about that, that question of, of why, why I do what I do. And I think. I'm really animated by the potential that I think theater has um, to transform community, and that's how I judge my work. I mean, it is by the uh, impact of the work in the world. So I'm a little leery of um, the idea, like when I have, I take notes as I, as I read plays, and um, I do a little summation in my head. But I'm not going to write a beautiful, publishable um, report on a play that um, is just going to go and, and, and like, uh, fester in a database, you know, um, like I, but I would be happy, I do and would be happy to write a beautiful publishable recommendation of a play that I believe in along with my heart, you know, and it goes again to that question of who are the, who are the best people to like kind of articulate uh, the spirit of a play, and so I, um, I, I don't know, I would be a little leery about, um, about uh, uh, having a database of every every play that comes through and having a bunch of reports out there for, um, for people who don't necessarily connect to the play, doesn't attend to their mission. But I would love to have a database out there of plays that get us fired, back, fired up. So the heartbreak, the heartbreak. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing, a list of just favorites. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I've been kind of trying to work on as I try to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. And one of the things is this idea of, I think when Polly read those first things, one of the things that you read was mine. I've been really trying to figure out how we market 
displays to each other, not to the public, not to our subscriber bases, but to each other. And, you know, is there a way to do it better? Those, if I were to say to each of you, tell me about one play that you love, one heartbreak play, one play you believe in, love heart. Would it be a resource that would be of interest to other people? I mean, the LMDA has historically done that in different formats, offered its members a like opportunity to sort of like give us a here, here's a form, fill it out for every play that you love, and we'll put it on our website. And um, Janine and I have been in the process of talking about how to revive that on our current website. So I mean that's something that we definitely already want to do. I think it's. You know, LMDA as an organization can't do the database. We don't have the technical capacity. We don't have the computer skills. <laughs> we just can't do that. But as far as like hosting recommendations of plays that people love, yes, we can and want to and have done. Yep. Just there so many new plays that we do believe in that we are individually in each of our institutions working on, be it in development, in a reading, in a production, and then I worry that nothing happens after that with them, because we're not talking to each other in a, and I, I don't know, maybe we, I know we do it casually all the time, but does there need to be some sort of format for sharing that information? There's one little scary, I mean, Eric and I were talking about this earlier, there's just like one little scary thing to me about that, even the even the aggregate of all the like of the heartbreak, list, right? And and that is, does it magnify the shadow that large institutions already cast? Would be the question I have, right? So Frankie, my friend Frankie, who is an unknown playwright who did not go to an MFA program, Frankie can't get into, doesn't have a door to get into to, into my institution right now, right? And so. But Frankie maybe has a chance at the storefront theater that is run by an alum of his school. But if that storefront theater run by the alum of Frankie's school starts looking to our database of, of heartbreak lists, does that actually make it harder for Frankie in a, in a weird show? You know? What? But why wouldn't Frankie's play be in there too? That's because the idea of a, to, well, because what, I mean, what, what are the mechanisms that float back? You know, I mean, because if it's if it's uh, a database consisting of the plays I really wish we could produce, and Madeline and 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 Tanya Tanya here really wish we could produce, like that, just like is a potential echo chamber of. But what if we if we're soliciting from theaters of all sizes? Yeah. Well, then how do you search it? How do you you know how? I don't know, this is the thing, I was online some, with somebody last week. I, I'm, you know, I'm old, I'm tired. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just to the point where I want to stop talking about it and just try it. So if you all get an email from me in the next week and you're into it, I just, because I have found myself where I found myself in my world, I'm needing to launch and I, this is something I feel really passionate about, something I've been working on for 25 years. And I look back at what happened with Florida Stage and those, you know, three to five to eight world premieres, the five to eight readings, all of those plays that we worked on over the years, some of which were magnificent and never got to make another, have another production, or maybe had one other. I want to find a way to share those, the 50 plays that I'm jotting down for people. I want you guys to know about it. You can produce them or not, doesn't matter. I just want to make sure that the playwright's work is getting spread out there to people who might. And I want to, I want to take it a little bit beyond just the people on the circle because I think one of the things that we hear over and over again from especially the smaller um, organizations that don't have literary offices, they don't have access to that list of plays is a very there's a very um, small universe. Of, I used to have in the Z space days. I used to have um, plays in progress. That was like really the only thing I knew to go to. And what was that? A dozen publications a year, maybe less. Um, and 
and so those were the, that was the universe of things I knew to pick from because it was well publicized that it was available. And, and then we started going to the local, making relationships with the local writers. But um, so I just wonder if, is there a way that all of the energy of this room aggregates um, for the field rather than being done as, you know, at the, the O'Neill energy is an enormous amount of energy that's done for that one organization. Is there some benefit to that organization aggregating for the infrastructure? Heather, you had a point in. Aren't you then just changing the portal? Isn't it just making another door? Because then you're going to have playwrights think, well, how do I get on that list? It's, you know, it's like it's just changed the submission. You're still, I mean, I don't know what the other playwrights think. It, it just, to me, it's like, it, it's just shifting how you're then getting in. Because now you, you've got to get on that list. And I don't know if it's going to be any different for Frankie of how you I get on that sure. list. I, I, I think the, the world of communication is shifting. How we, you know, I'm not saying that we need like a like button by each play, right. but that's kind of how we think of things now, is what's everyone talking about in our Facebook feeds and our whatever the hell is telling us everyone's talking about is more likely that I'll click on that New York Times article than another one. So I wonder if there's some of that, if it's not, if, if the, the idea doesn't appear to be another hole to throw things that we aren't gonna play with right now in, but if it's, a, a, another source, a, a, a way that if if that play is on 50 people's heartbreak list, somebody please produce that play. <laughs> please put a put it in a reading or something, or at least uh, get to know that writer, or somebody commission that writer to write something specifically that that might be more likely to be produced. So I, I would be super curious as to what those heartbreak lists are. Well, I, I'm going to go ahead and and, and say let's. I, okay, two more comments and then <laughs> and then move off the database, but. Uh, but capture it as something to keep discussing um, that seems to have enough energy to kind of look at as, but again, the why being time, mainly aggregating all this energy so that everybody's not doing all of it yourselves. Yeah. And there's that, that sense of like um, building on each other's efforts. I mean, I think if we take responsibility for getting to know the playwrights in our backyards, you know, um, uh, being, being, Having a more open policy towards local writers who haven't been produced or who don't have an MFA, and um, making making that a goal, making access for local writers a goal. If all of us do that, you know, um, most of the writers in America are going to have some point of entry. Right. And um, and like what I get excited about about this idea of finding a way to you know recommend works that you know we can't produce. It also gives me a way to. Um, uh, uh, feed the work of artists at different levels, mm -hmm. you know? So, like, the, one of the things that's been heartbreaking to me in my work, I, I believe in producing organizations, I, be, I believe that playwrights need money, I believe that plays move in time and space and they are not up words on the page, I believe in all of that. And it's also heartbreaking that, like, if I read a, a script by a playwright with promise, but that is not going to be ready, I can tell it's not going to be ready for production, you know, um, with the time and space that we're able to get, give to it. They're just not at that phase in their career. Really what I, what I have been able to do is write an encouraging rejection letter, you know? But if there is this resource where I can say, like, this is what really excites me about this person's voice, and I create, I'm really excited to see how it develops. I would love that. Let me come uh, segue from that, is that okay? Mm -hmm. So you, you talked about the writing the letter. We talked about uh, the office of the future would uh, have an authentic connection between the way in which plays were invited, playwrights were invited, and, and the way uh, people communicated back an interest or lack thereof in the plays. Uh, is, that, is that something we all can agree as, as something we want to institutionalized going forward, that there's, there's a relationship that, that is authentic and upheld between the mission and purpose of the organization and the, the relationship between the selection process and the, um, the submission process, the rejection letters, that, that, that's, that that goes all the way through. That seemed to be something people were 
nobody objected to that earlier. Do you? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I, I just wonder how we make that concrete. Um, so, so one of the things that came up in, in was with you guys, so that breakout <laughs> session, uh, was the idea of like listing the things that are actually possible uh, to happen at your institution on your submission mm -hmm. policy. Um, you know, and because I know mine doesn't. I'm like, I accept queries and, uh, you know, I have this other relationship and I accept stuff from people we have artistic relationships with. But it might be interesting to say, and here are all the things that might happen. Might happen. And if I was really brave and very persuasive with my bosses, mm -hmm. I might say, and here's the percentage of time that that is actually occurred. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I would say, like, I just quickly say that, like, New George just has a really great uh, narrative uh, on their submission page, which is, talks about what they do and don't get from their submissions and how they use their pile. And it's, it was really when I was when I was at Actors Theatre, we sort of used it as we were reinvestigating how we were using uh, doing our submission policy. So I New commend it. It's very it's 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 narrative. It's chatty. It makes you like love them and you're to work with them, but understand that they're a very busy, passionate group of people. I, and I interrupted. It. Oh, that's right. I just wanted to build on what Aaron, what Aaron was talking about and what we talked about in our um, that breakout session. That it came out of um, the, after the circle table circle where people had been talking about giving writers access, and um, so we started talking about at the different theaters represented in the group. What what does that actually mean? Like what what would a playwright actually get access to? And the answers were so divergent. From um, at the O'Neill, there's some professional development and networking that they can get out of that experience as well as the experience to you know work to push up the play and that. At, at, you know, and Aaron was talking about office hours. And Joy was talking about um, sort of described it as giving a writer the imaginative space of the people who work at that theater, and that that was this extraordinary gift. And I just thought it was really beautiful to have all of those different ways in which people conceive of what they offer to playwrights articulated, and that it's such a wide variety. And to be really, it would be really exciting to be that transparent about what it is you think you're offering the playwrights who do get access to your institution. I think that would help playwrights seek the kinds of relationships they want. Because we talk a lot about like get giving access and seeking relationships and getting through the gate, but then it's like, well, well then what's there for you when you get there? And, and I think there's really wildly divergent perceptions of what it is we're trying to get through the door for. And, um, and I think we all want different things, and we're so rarely on either side of the, that asked to articulate what, what that is, what it is that, that you actually can offer, and what it is that we actually want. And um, I, I've just found that really inspiring to hear these like concrete examples that were so different, um, and that helped me think about oh, I might want to you know, pursue that opportunity and not that opportunity, and, and that that would help I think also whittle down the size of the pile. Yeah. And I wonder too, along the lines of transparency, I, I wonder uh, if if it can be a part of the submission. Um, language about how it happens, because I do think there is there is a knowledge about how many different readers there might be. What is that process? Because then it's also like, oh, okay, do I want to go through that process? Because I do think that there's some misunderstanding about how that happens, which um, is just part of that disconnect. So, 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 so transparency as a value of the literary office, and to push that as far as we can in our own office. You know, I, I would, it, it, this uh, gets me to something else that I talk about all the time, but to think more broadly about what resources you actually have to offer. Like, what, what are the assets that are of value to, to playwrights? And, and I talked about this. We, we are in the, um, the kind of crazy place of having a playwright house <laughs> that, we, that we have um, for the residency program. And there is, from time to time, room there. And someone could... If, you know, we could actually make a grant, not of a uh, reading process or a, um, you know, a production or a workshop, but of a retreat. And what would that cost us? You know, it's there. We're already paying the rent on it. You could have a week in the house, and you could come see the shows here, and you could wander around the institution. Um, but so to think more, um, more broadly about what an asset actually is and get out of this, it only is you and me rehearsing my play. Like, what is that responsibility to think beyond just the, you know, the play we're going to pick? And I, I mean, I think, 
you know, Madeline's talking about a little bit with, okay, we, we're, our, part of our community involvement is going to be to replay, so that's something we can do, or, you know, like, so thinking, thinking bigger than play selection to production, and, you know, the, the reason, you know, the reason I started HowlRound was because I was at an institution where I was saying no all the time, and I found that so weird, I'd never done that, and it was, like, so freakish, and so, and I, the idea was um, really just so that I could say yes, because I could just say yes to anybody who wanted to publish something, and which is what you know has been happening in, in that space. And it, it, what it makes me—it feels like there's so many ways now to en to engage people and to make them feel heard and part of a community that doesn't any longer just have to be. I liked your play so much, and we're going to produce it. You know, there's a way, and the conversations that I've had with artists just editing that journal have been some of the most fulfilling that I've had in my career. Just the, just the back and forth about the things that artists care about and want to write about. And so I feel like, you know, there's a lot of that kind of opportunity that, um, that and, the, and the obsession, the thing that we're kind of training people around is like the room, the room, the production, the production. But it's really about, what I feel like, I, it's really about a life. It's about making a life in this work, you know? And to make a life, it's like a much bigger story. And so I feel like, I feel like because this group in particular, what inspires me about this group is they're already tapped into that idea of the bigger story, right? They're, they are this kind of liaison between the audience sometimes, and the, they're doing the talk back, they're contextualizing. I mean, it's sort of what so many parts of the job do include. And so I just feel like there's, it, it, I'd love to think about, you know, three or four concrete things that would fit that, like, you know, you just offered one up the playhouse, but what are other ways we can create a community um, so that people feel like they're a part of something, you know? We talked about that in our session, but, um, I, and I know it came up at the device theater meeting, whatever, two, three years ago, um, in terms of, because all, all, all devising artists, I think, need as a room to be together. Like that's that's that core thing that came out, which many places have uh, in mm -hmm. a, in abundance. Um, uh, but this thing also of how how many different platforms are there besides the slot, um, and just continuing to expand that no that notion. I mean, right now, I feel like I work in environments. I work in trying to set up environments where things can happen, where creativity can happen, where inspiration can happen, where conversation can happen, where exchange can happen. And so how can we look at the spaces that we have that, and look at what is the environment we want them to feel like inside? Once, like you said, Deborah, like when you get in there, then what? Like, when you've got through the gate, you're sitting, like, so, so what is it inside? And, and that kind of exchange between when a playwright is inside of the institution, we gain so much by having them in an artistic conversation, <laughs> talking to the marketing department, bringing in other colleagues that we might not have known about. Like, we're getting so much as much as hopefully a playwright is feeling like they're getting something from being there. So, kind of, you know, looking at the exchange within the environment that we're creating, that is both give and take. services that we like to think that we give writers. When I was at McCarter, and this is actually while this was there, uh, you know, we talked a, a lot to writers that we were beginning to develop relationships with, already have relationships with, monitor relationships with, to find out what their ideas were about what kinds of things would be useful to them. And one of the things that we heard a lot was writers uh, wanted to be able to talk shop with other writers um, outside of the pressures of when they're actually in rehearsal and production uh, at our theater or at other theaters when typically, you know, beyond meet and greets uh, or an overlap when two productions uh, were both in, uh, you know, were both up, they actually didn't often even have time with other writers um, in this community we were trying to build. Anyway, out of those conversations, uh, McCarter decided to try uh, a, a writer's retreat on the campus of the university um, at Princeton, and this was actually after the session was over with, so you know, there happened to be a, a lovely sort of nine bedroom bed and breakfast on the campus that was available at a cut rate because it wasn't during the academic year. Um, and we were able, after the first year, I think, 
to cultivate a local family foundation to take over the support of that initiative. And they were thrilled to do it because it was a designated uh, and uh, sort of necessary function to, for, to these kinds of goals. And they were very happy uh, to be able to underwrite. And as far as I know, that annual treat is still happening. Uh, and it's, it's, it was just a great sort of confluence of those kinds of ideas. And the fact that it had nine bedrooms meant just nine writers. <laughs> it was very manageable. Um, and it was also a way to extend relationships with writers that were not about necessarily writers who were commissioned or maybe who were ever even going to be produced at McCarter, but became part of the larger community of writers with whom, you know, McCarter was in conversation. So anyway, that was a, a it was just an example of a, of a need we tried to isolate and found resources to support that and has had really uh, terrific longevity. I mean, just hearing that, Erin, hearing what you're saying in terms of the face-to-face, -face, knowing that this place will be called Theater on the Commons, Theater uh, the Center for Theater Commons. Center for Theater Commons. Um, I recognize uh, uh, I'm uh, in an awkward position saying this as a devising artist, but coming back to this thing of naming, I, I circle the word literary, and, and because it seems like, it, yes, it's language driven, yes, it's, uh, and we, we publish, so I think we're a more text driven company, the team is, than, than most devising artists, but um, just how, how much, how the office can be shaped towards life and culture that then is centered around what the actions that what these words will become um, and that that sort of face-to-face uh, -face and whole conversation versus the pile which is which does feel like literature. So let's be artist liaisons. Like the center of our job is is uh, is which, which it is already, you know, I'm not suggesting anything radical, but the center of our job is building uh, artistic relationships, uh, be, not only between the institution and artists, but between artists as well. I mean, hearing your story about MacArthur, I think, wait a minute, in my stack, I have four Chicago writers who may or may not know each other, who could really get something out of, wait a minute, I'm going to call them all, we're going to have coffee together, and they'll meet each other. That's gorgeous, why not? You know, Amy Fried has also said several times, and Amy, I'm going to ask you to see if, if I get this right, uh, that there, for you, the idea of even reading other plays before the theater uh, would be, you would find that a, a, a way to relate to the theater. Like a, I mean, it's your resident here, so it's... It was, you know. Yeah, I, I think I could speak for a number of other playwrights who've had the good fortune in their lives to been produced in the American theater, I consider it a, a privilege to be tapped to read. You know, one of my concerns has always been who does the reading at theaters, especially as, you know, people's budgets get cut and people's aunts and students are reading things. And, um, you know, those of us who, you know, continue to read, some of us that teach especially are kind of tuned in to that issue of writer's voice and maybe are um, disposed to see things through the warts and all that sometimes come with a new play, I think would be a very good resource. What, what would you say, uh, and then other writers can this, but what would you say, of, uh, what kind of parameters would be useful to, for you around that? Clearly, we're, we're not going to, well, as a playwright, uh, as a busy uh, playwright, you, you're a playwright, you're teaching, you're, you have yeah. uh, productions that you're uh, in. Uh, you know, things flex given a season or a year, but I mean, certainly while I am partaking of a residency program like this, I would consider it uh, a kind of a welcome responsibility Responsibility to be script a month, you know? Yeah, so it's not like it's the answer to the slush pile. Oh yeah, like make the make, no. make the <laughs> read them all, but a curated uh, conversation between yeah. you and the work that we're interested in is also a way for you to relate to the theater. It seems like a very logical thing to ask of any writer that's doing a long-term residency and, and where their their gift, you know, for language and for the shape of a raw script, you know, could be well employed. Please speak up for me. I, I wonder if that might be part of the liaison, the liaisoning um, that could happen. It could have somebody 
a younger writer, an emerging writer, part of this, however you find them, slush pile or writers groups or whatever, might someone might coordinate coffee between, say, Amy and a writer whose work you read, and you're like, actually, I really kind of like this. It may not be ready to jump on stage, but a conversation um, could, uh, that seems to actually grow and connect and fuel the, the form and, and the art um, more than just uh, connecting playwrights with playwrights. Yeah, yeah, I think some of that, I also think we've got to be careful to not be, you know, dragging a piece of bologna in front of a starving person. <laughs> <laughs> contract and see where it says they're going to be on stage, you know, they want the production. So I, I'm thinking, you know, to, you want to be careful that we would not replace that vital hunger, you know, which is to make the connection. But I think that, like for me at Arena, where, you know, the terms of my residency where I was given a, a production, so that part of my, the raging furnace within me was fed, you know. So I'm in a position to be generous and clear-headed. <laughs> and looking for employment to keep me out of trouble while you're worrying. Yes, it would have been a, a perfect thing, will be a perfect thing if anybody yeah. ever that wanted to put me to work that way. Take you out yeah. <laughs> yeah, as uh, someone who's come to playwriting late, I guess, fairly late in life, I, I just wanted to say that I'd like to enlarge the thinking about the term emerging artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because inside that phrase is emerging young artist, and I just wanted to point out that not everybody has the luxury of writing when they're young. Some of us need to be journalists who actually you know, need to make a living from a very young age. So I'd just like, like you all to consider that emerging artists and emerging young artists are not necessarily the same. What's an interesting uh, point, because we've talked in many uh, groups about how do we get outside the, uh, the credentialing. Like, Frankie is a guy who doesn't have an MFA. Uh, <laughs> and just, Frankie is also 55, I just decided. <laughs> <laughs> there, done. <laughs> Is that a New York thing? Uh, I mean, I I'm talking about foundations that are not New York based, so. Grants are terrible for nimbleness know, uh, and for thinking short in advance. So like we, you can't write the, you can't have the TBA slot. If you, yeah, if you have to uh, raise money for it two years in advance. And it's something, you know, they, they ended up with a private family foundation that, that supported that work. And, you know, we've had to seek other sources of income from the not, slightly less traditional funding sources to, to support Could, nimbleness. And uh, I'm not saying we get it all right all the time, but I, I, I have found it pretty satisfying to be able to say um, to a playwright, well, what, what do you want? What do you want us to do? Do you want to get in a room with actors for two days? Do you want us to do a reading? Do you not just want us to do a reading? Yeah. Do you want what, you know? And, and to be able to, to do that, you have to have money to be able to do that, and you have to have be able to complete the foot. But um, there's a larger conversation about you know whether well, there's a the whole conversation about whether systems are the answer. 
we've thrown out some systems that I think in a way that has been beneficial to us. But the flip side of that is having a conversation with funders about this whole piece because I'd love to get a list systems. of funders that are not responsive to nimbleness. Just yeah. because I think that that, though, that set of funders is way behind the curve, yep. and it would be great to just sort of say to some of the leading funders, you know, you need to talk to your colleagues here. Yeah. If, if, because those, those are all going away, and the, and the leading funders have, have really made a point of it. Like, they've yeah. been beating people up about the, those sort of template-based programs are less and less fundable in the leading part of the world. Yeah. So it would be great to, yeah. to know who they need to talk to. <laughs> Finding language to describe why nimbleness is a virtue for an institution is, is something that we can all do, actually. Mm -hmm. And what, like, how we need to maneuver or how we want to be able to have conversations with the artists that we are working with or seek to work with, and to be able to have a back and forth about what might be the best thing for the play that we're interested in supporting, um, so that we can turn around and then say that to somebody who might pay for it. You know, is, uh, is a concrete thing that I think we can work on within the context of our own missions. What, what, um, what other things might comprise the um, literary office of the future that we haven't yet talked about? But it, we're not going to draw it today, but... Uh, you're talking about, uh, as far as what the literary office relationship to playwrights is and how maybe we bring playwrights together. I just want to add more playwrights and housing being a really useful one. Uh, but I also want to mention that we've had really a wonderful success by also bringing um, scenic designers, sound designers, directors, all the other artists in touch with the playwrights, not around a specific play, but just simply, you know, how are the scenic designers reading these scripts? What are, you know, what are their lines? And so there, there's great capacity for diversity and experience for playwrights that aren't necessarily getting work done at the institution. Joy? Um, I want to brag on, we're stealing idea from um, Ben I think there's um, a lot of power in conversation. I totally believe in the power of a well-moderated conversation to um, affect the entire trajectory of a community institution. That they start out like their their processes with these plays. And I mean, I guess John, you should describe this. I'm just going to repeat back what happened, what you told me yes, yesterday. But um, they have a, uh, a all staff meeting where the playwright is there talk about the play to um, staff members who have read it, and then the entire the organization, everybody's invited to talk about the play, about um, what uh, the conversations within the play, what's exciting about the play, what makes the play feel alive, you know, what they're hoping their audiences, audience members will talk about and take away, and, you know, anyway, I, I can let you describe it, but I love that, and I actually think that's a way that, I understand that the idea of, like, the connectivity work, you know, is a lot to take on. But I actually think that, that having that conversation early enough that it influences the work that everybody else is doing is a way that, you know, you can um, live connectivity through just that one conversation mm -hmm. early on. A really great result of that, I will say, is the unity of sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. So that each show can have, I mean, you have your mission as a theater, but then also each show has its own I mean, we call them entry points, but they're, they're our little mission statements. Yeah. Like, what what are we all rallying around beyond just, like, the play on the page? What the artist has said about the play, what they think the play is about, what we as an institution are, are excited about. Like, we all just air it, and that's um, really important, and it's important to that. For us, that that happen as early as possible. Uh, this is something that came up in one of the uh, breakups that I was listening in on, is the timeline for what's the time when you would, uh, what you're talking about at the table there, uh, Jerry, what's the time when you have to come into the process in order to have done your homework? And it gets really, really early. It's a lot earlier than most of us think it is. Um, when when uh, you, I, I, I can't remember, I'm, I'm gonna lose the example right now, but we had one uh, where the, the season brochure had exactly the wrong information, not just the right, not having the right information, but exactly the wrong information. Uh, which we never got the, that word until we sat down well later in the process after all the copy. Oh, actually, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> never mind. Um, <laughs> um, but, but, the, but the process, we think, we tend to think of it, some places think of it from first rehearsal, some think of it from the beginning of design conversations. 
But it really goes back even before season planning, because season planning for a lot of us, I would imagine, uh, by the time you get ready to announce the season plan, the season, there are already at least commissioned, if not executed, uh, graphics that are associated with this uh, season that are going out into the brochure that are then you're going to live with for 18 months. And so that process of the group speaking about the art and being ready to talk with one voice starts from uh, you know, a year and a half before opening night. And uh, we, we aren't yet prioritizing that time uh, for the artists or for our communities or our institutions as a field, I don't think. Would you say that's true? Yeah. Well, it's, mm -hmm. but, I would also, but I also just want to have having this conversation a lot recently is, you know, at the table earlier there's a question of whether or not art is really at the center of a lot of uh, American theater institutions, you know. And so I connect that thought to what you're saying because the implication is, well, the marketing timeline is the marketing timeline, so we have to start earlier and align ourselves with that. Like, part of me wants to say, well, maybe part of our job is to figure out how to make the marketing timeline different, because the real discoveries of the work don't happen until you really start working on it. In the, in the big yeah. regional theater, it's not even marketing, it's the Tessitura timeline. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the, the, yeah. Yeah. Right. But actually, yeah. Tessitura is driving like, uh, how our relationship to the art. That's a, it, I just find that sort of fascinating. <laughs> Temperature is a, um, is a ticketing system, and so whenever you create a season, the box office needs uh, so much time now. So, in Mar so for, at Steppenwolf, the issue was not even so much marketing was driving. It was marketing because marketing supervises the box office, but it wasn't marketing in the way you're articulating it. It was marketing in terms of the box office needed so much time to build out the Tessitura um, structure for the subscribers. So that that kept pushing back season planning, pushing back season planning, pushing back. So, you know, now it's so far out there. Um, you know, so anyway, but just interesting to note it's, All right, well, let's you know. create a team of ex-programmers and go fix that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is also, though, I mean, in addition to, don't to we start on Tessitura, oh, how we miss Artsoft, but, um, but just that there is also the newsletter issue, there is also the magazine issues, there is all of that, too, and the graphic designers, and things that do take time, and there isn't a space built in I understand why all of that has to happen to a certain extent, as much as I wish I could shred, rip it down and like, you know, but there's, a, there's not a second space for a lot of us to then continue the conversation. I mean, you guys at Steppenwolf do a great blog that I know a lot of your audience follows, but of what actually is, is changing or, you know, to actually shift anything once it has actually happened. I mean, I think even for OSF, which, you know, I love the way we do season planning with everybody from the organization involved, it's, it's magic. But it also means that I've known what the 2013 season is for the last three months. And that's really weird to me that I have nothing to do until then, <laughs> but it's also out there already. And how much needs to get decided in advance in addition to marketing, it's it's production staffing, it's the the contracts that designers need to have in place. It's, there's a lot that I wish we could, we keep talking about doing things earlier, and I want to find better ways to do things later. But is it uh, actually a question of doing them at the right, so, so you would like to be able to be nim more nimble in, in your responses to uh, opportunity programming in a way, to be able to be on something, sure. do it quickly. But also once that, <laughs> once that decision is made, even if it's a year and a half in advance, it seems like that's the point where these conversations are already being begun. Like there, there needs, homework has to have been done by then. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got this 37 commission project. Uh, a draft comes in. There's got to be some kind of a response to the draft, uh, even if it's just the dramaturg and the playwright exchanging views and maybe some notes out of that. I mean, uh, ideally, I would think that process would take at least most of a year, particularly for a, 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 an organization like OSF where you'd be encouraged to write for a large cast. I mean, it, the productions are, are bound to be more complicated given the historical aspect, given the resources of the theater. Uh, you know, the, the more planning you have, I, I, I think the better it, it is, because those things are big. Somebody used the battleship model here. It's like this thing, that how hard it is to turn around. 
and it really is. If you look like at the National Theater in England and how far out their their programming, it's it's two to three years, and yet they still have the capacity. To your point, Julie, to to do something in three or four months, it's just going to be in the paint shop, mm -hmm. or it's going to replace a show in the Olivier or something like that. But there there's a plan B that goes along with it, which is another way of dealing with it. I think part of also what I'm suggesting is that. <coughs> Like, no matter how well you plan those conversations, we all discover new things that happen once the first rehearsal starts in Florida. So, so what we're missing, and what we try to do, I think partially through audience connectivity, but what we're missing is a good mechanism to communicate the new things that we discover to potential audiences. Like, right, we're just locked into the, to the marketing and the newsletter and the magazine we made three months ago, and we don't have a really good way to, to communicate what's what's going down now. But you know, it, I, I mean, you can do readings of those plays, you can do other things. At the, at the Globe, when I was there, we did a Howard Quarter play, and the marketing department came up with this graphic, you know, with a Seguro cactus in it, because they thought they grew in New Mexico. Well, they don't. <laughs> All right, so the, the thing is out, it's in, you know, ready to go out, and it's it's like, hold it. Uh, you know, you don't, we're going to be a laughing stock with this kind of thing. So that should have been surveyed much earlier than it was, uh, particularly by the writer. You know, if, had the writer been a, pro, uh, a part of that marketing session, that, that would have never happened. So, I, I mean, I, you, your point is absolutely right. You're going to discover more things in rehearsal. But the more readings you do, the more workshops you do, the more time you spend with the play ahead of time, the fewer things are going to surprise you once you get to it. And those, and those discoveries don't have to be part of the overall that gigantic marketing picture. Um, they, they can be enhancements along the way. I'm sure we all do that with our Facebook posts about the shows that are going on and, and that, the dramaturgy that happens in the, in the rehearsal room and the little videos that our marketing department puts out about rehearsals along the way. I just think big picture is one thing. These little pieces that we learn along the way, that's just great. That's spice. I, I'm going to start doing this where I... Um, Raise your hand, you know, wave at me, and I'll, and I'll write your names down and, and go in order. I, I saw Madeline earlier, but it's, it's going to roll like that for me. So Madeline, and then to Liz, and then to Ilana, and then I'll look up again. Go ahead. Um, Aaron, one thing that we do that we actually stole from Louis at OSF is I write a letter to every person that holds a ticket, that goes out to every person that holds a ticket, subscribers, single ticket people, about the show, and I write it after first preview. So it sort of sucks that people in first preview People in previews don't get to read it, but I have to see the show with an audience to actually know what the show is. Mm -hmm. So I write a letter just about whatever's on my mind, about what I think people would be interested in knowing, either something that happened in rehearsal or something that contextualizes the show in a way that we didn't get to do in the program because it had to be turned in before we started rehearsal and we didn't know. So um, that's, and, and I call them minor notes mm -hmm. to the production. Sure. So that's something that that's great. we found to be really helpful. So I'm going to see my... Okay, wave again. Ilana? Yeah. Uh, I just was going to say that I think um, sometimes, I mean, I've heard, I've heard peers of mine um, sort of express nervousness about inviting playwrights in to talk with marketing as if somehow, um, and, I, and I've heard playwrights say, well, I, I'm not the marketer. I don't want to do, you know, why is it on my shoulders? But I think that there's a sweet spot that we can hit. Um, Chris Diaz speaks really passionately about this, about, I mean, as a playwright, he talks about, you know, use me, make me, let me share my knowledge with you as early as humanly possible and let me, um, let me tell you how available I can be so that you can uh, work with me to figure out not just the marketing stuff, not just poster and copy, but like if he can be there, how to use him in the community, how to like go beyond the walls of the theater, how to be part of, of uh, conversations with, with the community and potential audiences. And to me, I, I think that's really phenomenal and I don't want to say that, that Chris Diaz's instincts are, are, are every playwright's instincts, but I think also sometimes we get afraid maybe of putting, of asking too much of the playwrights, and I think that, that maybe there's a way to find that sweet spot where we can ask for things while saying, of course, if you don't want to do this or can't do it, no problem, but like, would you like to be involved in this part of our, our work? Can, Karen, can you talk a little bit about the uh, Theater 101 around uh, book club play and, and how much we pulled you in on that and what, how that felt? That was great. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, 
that's part of what I meant when we were talking in the little circle is pulling us in to talk to marketing and talk to different people because we know, these are our children, we know these plays well and we can talk with a, an authority and enthusiasm to know why we wrote these plays. And when we were doing the book club play, one of the big reasons why I wrote this play was because I was interested in the community that's built that people are not connected people go to book clubs in order to just connect with other people and talk about things. Mm -hmm. And so something we talked about with our dev was how do we get people in the audience connected even before they get into the play. So one of the things was people writing their favorite books. Mm -hmm. um, and so already people were starting talking to a name tag. And the other thing was that I thought we should, we had a theater 101 was the idea of if they've never been part of a book club, how does it feel to be part of a book club? And so we sat down and talked about how to conduct the book club. And we picked two books that my book club, book club had read, and one was highbrow and one was lowbrow, that were not inside the place. It was an outside experience. And we made these 50 people in the community read Lolita and Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which, which one was highbrow? <laughs> I will let you say it there. But, um, it, the passion that aroused, uh, and we weren't even talking about the theater, we just talked about the books that informed and contextualized the performance in so many different ways. It was really, I thought it was a really successful and exciting way to, uh, to use what I knew about why book clubs were interesting. And it was fun, I mean, it wasn't a drag. You, you, it wasn't a drag. You, I mean, it was extra work, but it was so, uh, so uh, fulfilling and exciting. And, and I remember just this little lady came by. She's like, she's like, oh, tonight wasn't wasn't about. I, I, I felt like I was part of a family, and I haven't felt that in a long time. And I like that's why I do theater because I want to feel part of a family. And I, I was like, that is the best review ever. You know. I we on the connectivity uh, front. So let me ask you a question. This I'm about to switch topics. You want to come in? Keep going, and I'll go after. Okay. Uh, so here we are in the connectivity front. Is this appropriately part of the literary office at this point? Is this uh, is it a, is it's grown it's grown up that way? We've got an institution that's moved it into its own department. Uh, it it's as you say the shavings. It's it's attached itself to the work of the literary office. It's much of your life, Amritha. Um, uh, and how is it is it part of the literary life of the organization is it part of the literary offices or is that a place that we can say move that somewhere else marketing connectivity development uh and uh, we'll focus on the uh, production process that it's actually a distraction what what's the sense of this when we say connectivity what we're talking about like um lobby displays our post show discussions outreach talk, that kind of is that what the, we're talking about? What, what's what's the range of stuff that you're you know, yeah, range of things. Absolutely, it's um, it's definitely lobby displays, post show discussions, um, other types of engagement or enrichment events per show. Like um, for Music Man that's coming up, um, one of the big ideas that um, Molly has for it is making sure that we engage the local marching bands community for it. Since so much about the show is you know the power of marching bands and arts education at the end, so bringing in a different marching band every night to perform 76 trombones that we totally stole from Trinity Rep. So thank you, Trinity Rep, out there. Um, and so that's part of the coordination that we're now doing for that. Um, uh, program notes, um, Theater 101 that Karen talked about. That's um, worked through. Uh, literary office um, subtext, um, which is our kind of dramaturgical guide that Janine and David actually started, um, that we essentially have a group of uh, writers who write different articles about um, the history, the themes, the content, the behind the scenes for each show, and then post that on the web, and it's usually up for about two years after the show has been produced, so that other, you know, theaters, students, audience members from anywhere can access those. Um, gosh, there's there's probably so much more. Like I, those are the kind of the, the hot ones. There, but it's that about. range. But it's that that range of things. I think that stuff is the is. I don't know if it's the work of the literary office, but it's definitely the dramaturgical work of the theater. It's definitely. So I mean, I, I guess it depends on on how many people you have in your literary office. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on how many people you have in your literary office, right? Uh -huh. And in a big organization, Manhattan Theater Club, we don't do anything. It's all done by the education office. We have a State of New York, David Shukov. He runs discussions. He does all the promotion of that. He writes the letter that you write, Madeline, 
uh, and it's approved by Lynn Meadow and Mandy Greenfield. And me. uh, but I mean, so there, you know, there are different ways to skin that cat depending on the size of your organization. And the more people you have to address it, the better you'll probably do it, or you ought to. But you know, but the people who are doing it should have the kaleidoscopic view of the yeah. production and this, the institution and its identity that often is located in the artistic staff. I think. Yeah, and and going back to the early start, if you do a reading. You know, get the marketing director in there, get the education director in there, get everybody in to see it. And, and, and now they're invested. It's part of theirs too. And, and, I mean, just for that reason alone. But then they also bring an informed perspective to their jobs. So. I think it's not just investment, it's, you know, like, so when we started Subtext, because I was in the rehearsal room, I was in those conversations with the playwright, I knew you know, I had those conversations to know what it is that they wanted people to know and what it is that they were hoping people, which completely forms the outreach that then happens. It's, it, it informs what content goes on the website or in the program note or forms the discussion that I have with the audience. So maybe it doesn't, whether it lives completely in the literary dramaturgy office I don't know. I mean, the the idea that you're connected, that you haven't drawn firm boundaries, like that's fascinating. That there, but there should at least someone who has that bridge between the the actual being in with the art and the institution should at least have a voice in that conversation. Maybe they don't do everything, but there, I believe that there should at least be a voice. I think um, we've talked a lot in the last couple of days about um, the idea of getting plays or playwrights to the artistic director or being at the gate or keeping artistic directors from playwrights or what is that, what's that pathway. But I'd also like to talk about like what is the relationship and what is the conversation we are having with our artistic directors. We haven't you know, really talked about that very much and I think that's a whole other side of the coin. And I think about some of the most exciting season programming I see are because there's some really engaged, curious artistic directors who are having conversations with their artistic staff saying, what kind of conversations do we want to have in our community? Who are the writers to have that conversation? What kind of event can we create to have that conversation? When event, I don't mean just party. I mean, what, kind of, what does that play look like? What does that piece look like? What is that project? And so how often are we getting those quality times with the artistic directors to say, what's on your mind? What are you curious about? What are you passionate about? What should we be looking for? I mean, I'm thinking about like mixed blood theater, for example, I'm thinking about how ACT in Seattle has just created a fourth space in their theater out of a rehearsal room because there's so many ideas that Kurt was curious about and wanted to play with. Three theaters weren't enough, you know, so a, a rehearsal room has become a black box. And so th that, and that is coming from, I think, conversations with staff to kind of unpack those interests and those passions and then program out of that. And so I'm just wondering about the, the health and functionality of the conversations that we are or are not having with the artistic directors in the first place. Uh, oh, well, my. This is what happened. Even though I didn't. Okay. Well, I won't be responding to what Liz is saying, although I think it's a good thing to talk about. Um, I was just going back to this notion of where the idea of, you know, where the, all of these activities, these external connectivity activities take place. And I, I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that I appreciate at the Goodman is, um, I mean, the, I'm part of the artistic staff, so when we meet as a staff, we meet. It's literary, but then it's also like casting and education and community engagement and um, the producer, you know, so that's sort of, it's the whole step. And, and we, I, I mean, we do some of those kinds of things and then education does some of them. But the thing I like about education doing some of them, you know, yes, there's a lot of knowledge that the artistic department, me as the, you know, if I'm a dramaturg or my associate dramaturg or the casting director has knowledge about some of the things about the play that I might not have knowledge about. But, but the thing I like about our education department is they often look at it from a, from a social justice angle, from an angle that doesn't have necessarily to do with how the play evolved or the, its, its literary you know, genesis, but it has to do with how, you know, what are issues in the community that this could speak to, what are issues that this could speak to that are coming out of public school. You know, what are, what's the conversation going on in our community that this could speak to that I don't think I am an expert. I mean, I'm an expert in the sense that I live in the world and I'm a person and I live in that town, but I mean, I'm not, that's not what I'm spending all of my time in and I think that's actually really valuable. I mean, I think that there's, there's definitely events that my sensibility and our sensibility, I think, can help curate and create, but there's also other voices that, I, that are not my mindset that I 
think are really valuable to that connectivity element that um, that I think are good to welcome into that those tasks as well. Can I? Sorry, I, I agree. Um, you know, we worked a lot with the education department here, and that kind of um, relationship and conversation, I think, is absolutely vital. Um, I think. It, a lot of my point as far as making sure someone who is in that bridge it's so that you know the outreach or connectivity or whatever that type of information is doesn't just be, doesn't become that poster that had nothing to do with the show that you then have to live with but you're just confusing your audience more because now they have all this information but then they go to the show and they're like wait how did that connect because mm -hmm. I'm not really sure um, so that there is a way of so you are actually working in a way that's enriching the audience's experience with the show instead of just giving information so that you have information available. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think plays make meaning in different ways. And I think that the story that we're telling to people about the play and the way that we're preparing them to experience it and what they feel when they're there and afterwards um, should be organic and deeply enmeshed with the way that the play itself makes meaning, you know? And I don't know where that means that it lives, you know, I think that that, but I, but I, you know, I, I think there are a lot of people who have different skills to bring, but, you know, um, but I think that sense, that deep kind of spidey sense that we were talking about earlier about attention to um, the playwright's vision for the play, the way that the play makes meaning, the way that it unfolds, all of that is important to locate in um, the story that we tell about the play out in the world. <coughs> I want to, um, we're going to be out of time in a moment, and I would like to get everybody to do one quick thing, and I have a paper for anybody who doesn't have their own. I'd like people to write down three values that you think are intrinsic to the literary uh, office, that the three values that are they in a way. You guys to, to maintain and uh, safeguard as we go forward, and one thing to examine for change. Say the second, last part. Say one thing to examine to change of current practice, and just and write them down. Anybody need paper or? Yeah. Yeah. Three values that are intrinsic to the health, uh, health uh, and role of the literary office to maintain and uh, safeguard going forward. And one thing in current practice that uh, you would think you would like to have examined uh, to change or to just leave behind altogether. And actually, while you're at it, uh, then one thing, if, if you have anything, actually, as many things, a little list for yourself, which you won't have to read out loud, um, of things you'd like to go back and uh, try to take out and see, you know, push forward. Whether they were just ideas that occurred to you or ideas that were discussed in the room, but what, if anything, do you come out of this thinking, well, I want to go try something.
Okay. How you doing? Okay, a couple more minutes. We're going to go to dinner after this. What was the list, the other list, values, change, and And then for yourself, things that you want to go home to try. Thank <laughs> you. Some people are really writing. And then the second list is like things that we want. Something that, yeah, that's occurred to you that you want to Should we have an make an experiment. No, no, I'm not going to hand them in. We're just going to keep writing. Um, our mission-driven submission process and the sharing of work. Advocacy, honesty, conversation. Meaning making and contextualization of the work, the mission and the form through the work. Um, reading and thinking deeply about the work and advocating for it within and without the organization and passion for the written word and its potential to change the world. <laughs> Uh, honesty from playwrights about how the submission and production processes actually work. Playwright involvement as early in the process as possible from the moment the play is chosen. And a commitment to access that we not be a closed shop. Uh, transparency, and I think that's in every direction. Uh, assuming the role of stewardship for the organization, for the integrity of the mission. And um, uh, personal risk. Uh, the courage to be contrary. Mm. Keep coming. Um, I said a um, fierce commitment to mission, vision, and values of work and willingness to fight for that. Um, flexibility and nimbleness to keep pace or slightly ahead of changing forms, the constantly evolving spirit of community, and um, the uh, Sorry, the processes needed to realize the above. Um, and fostering community of artists, staffers, and audience. And then I added a conversation after you said that, because I think same thing. Um, I wrote, love of theater as a form, commitment to adv advocating for playwrights, and building a connection between the art and the community. Conversation, curiosity, centrality to an alignment of process. I just need to get that. 
the centrality, centrality to the process and the alignment of the process. Uh, personal relationship to playwrights and play development that is committed and personalized. Who else? Yeah. Uh, leading the conversation over a long term period with playwrights at many different stages in their careers. Being an advocate for playwrights and plays throughout the life of a production, including earliest marketing and design meetings. Helping artistic directors to maintain a sense of intellectual and mission integrity. Dramaturgy of the organization in season planning. We have uh, the University of Evansville has been listening uh, all weekend and the three values from there. Maintaining a stake in the mission, connecting, and remaining nimble. And then Austin uh, Bransgrove has also been listening all weekend and uh, the three from him, uh, collaboration, devotion to honesty, discovery of new artists and new art, and uh, engagement. There's, okay. You, there's, one, there's one more from here. Okay. This is from uh, Tony Adams who says, openness and generosity, transparency, curiosity, less polite dishonesty. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Does it, yeah, Jen. Uh, identify slash seek out work that is necessary, um, uh, keep an eye on the component parts of the institution to help articulate shared goals, which is, I think, uh, is what stewardship means. And uh, know when creative abrasion is better than consensus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jojo. Uh, maintaining, strengthening, developing the closer relationship between artistic director and literary office. Face time with playwrights and those interpersonal relationships, and then collaboration slash sharing of work. I just want to add expertise in dramatic form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> expertise? <Yeah. Does> <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you're fine? Otherwise, well, I just think that, that there's this weird, there's this weird resistance to, to owning some expertise. Anyway, expertise. Got it. Got it. Uh, I wrote dynamic and long-term, over-time conversations with artists about ideas, goals, practices. Um, flexibility uh, in that development and production to be adaptable to the various projects you want to move forward and time to reflect and dream and, the, and valuing that time. Heather, you ready? No. I mean, I don't have a literary office. I mean, my first thing was, do we have to have a season? <laughs> <laughs> Project-oriented and move projects forward in a variety of ways, given what the project and creator or creators need, want, and deserve. And then for I wrote maybe the name should be story department that encompasses not only the literary text part of story, but all the myriad ways in which you guys are moving story through an institution and is then thus expressed in the world. Great. You want? Yeah, I had um, commitment to maintaining the artistic health of a project or a company, um, relationships and collaboration as the starting point or the page one of any artistic endeavor, and synergy. Anyone else want to throw one out? Before we move on, yeah, madam. Uh, the one I have that is not competitive rigor of questioning why we are doing what we are doing. Okay, so everybody who hasn't shared yet, on the count of three, I want you to say them out loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One, two. I three. just wanted to add. Uh, most of mine have been said many times yeah. by other people, but but one that that I would add is. Uh, uh, I sort of think of myself as the person in the building who challenges the we don't do that, or I can't, we can't do that mentality that <laughs> tends to accrue within an institution, so. Is that part of the authenticity, John? Like, yes. Because, yeah, so you're challenging based on the, well, we say we do that, 
or, or it's, it, it is what we do, we just, you think we don't do it in a way. I mean, not just, it's not contrariness to be contrary, it's actually within the mission. And yes. Yeah. Yes. I think that's where we, a lot of times we get our reputations, but it's actually, there's, there's something we're standing on when we do that. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to share before the group, the group shout? Can I throw one out from online? Yeah. This is uh, Mark Maxwell who says, making playwrights feel unalone, keeping a literary eye on production, and giving an audience something to return to. Good. Are you, uh, what happened to the thing about what you're guarding against? Okay, well, I'm going to do that next. But I, but I, want, to get, I want to get the values in the air. Yeah. So go ahead, put your values in the air all together. One, two, three, go. Say that. That was totally my <laughs> People were hiding, but they're out there. I believe, it, I believe they're out there. <laughs> All right. Uh, who wants to start with the thing you put down to, to change? Leave behind interrogate for change. Go ahead, Amy. I see you. The fluorescent lights and bad furniture. <laughs> Yay! Not that. Guilt. Yep. Thank you, my people, Karen Zachary, as I wrote assumptions. assumptions. I want to come back, Natalie. Did uh, you say you want to interrogate whether increased transparency is better? No, I want I want to create more transparency. Ah, I see. Okay. So change the lack of transparency. Correct. Got it. How about the silent acceptance of soul suckery? <laughs> the silent <laughs> acceptance of soul suckery. <laughs> Slavery of the slush pile. <laughs> uh, I want to be uh, to allow the individual uh, talents and skills of the people that I hire underneath me on the artistic staff to dictate their contribution to the forward movement of the organization more than the role that, or the title they've been assigned to. So that it can be mutable. So that when you have somebody new, it will change the paradigm. Who has another one? Yeah. That all plays can be read rather than and to stop privileging language of words over, always over other theatrical languages. Words over us. Always. Is, that's, that's a framing of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, To do what you can to counter a culture of narcissism and risk avoidance that starts with strollers that look like armored tanks, play dates, <laughs> and bike helmets. <laughs> 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 and bike helmets. <laughs> <laughs> you are seated, you have a halo around you with the sun going down. So. Anyone else? All right. I'm, gonna, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just getting rid of unexamined activity. Unexamined activity. Getting rid of unexamined activity. So examine everything. All the activity. Okay. Yeah. Or get, just get rid of it if you have it. <laughs> Okay. Janine? Um, the acceptance that what my literary the priorities of my literary office have to be the same as the priorities of a different literary office. Mm. So the, get, we're getting rid of the notion of sameness there. Mm -hmm. was, uh, um, Lauren? Yes. Uh, the notion, to challenge the notion of speaking of training for these positions strictly in, a, in an academic context, mm -hmm. and that once you have a position, the training stops. I think that institutions still have a responsibility to train their employees one, after they get the job. Who else? Yes, Heather. That it's a rule. Any theater has to do a play a year by a living writer. <laughs> you want to challenge that assumption, or you want to I thought to change it, that it has to be that way. Okay, to change it to that. Yeah, but you okay. have to do a play. Yes. That all play development isn't, won't look the same per play per playwright, and um, to give the playwrights agency to ask for certain kinds of development that they need. Okay. And um, to think more broadly about the resources that we have on offer, and particularly um, uh, about that, you know, specializing um, development processes for plays, like thinking about connecting playwrights and um, designers 
early in the life of a play, um, to think about the, the life of a play as being, you know, moving through time and space and sound and image as well as words. I want to change my response time. Anyone else? All right, so I'm going to do one, two, three, and, and, and we're going to say them out loud. One, two, three. Say it. Some people have a poor audience how they want to hear it. Aaron's going to be giddy in two more minutes. We're going to make it, have him dip. <laughs> All right, last thing, and then we're going to dinner. Uh, can everybody just... Uh, start, it's like popcorn, just say it, I'm not going to call on people. Bright spots in the area, in this area right now, in this area of the literary office, the stuff we've been talking about today, let's just name some of the, the, the bright spots. People, institutions, uh, programs, whatever jumps to mind about, we should shout out these people, this, this. We should shout this out in this context. Who's got a shout out? We already had McCarter's uh, retreat um, as there are more opportunities for playwrights than at any time in the history of this country. Yes, abundance. Shout out. I walked into a writer's group with an amazing tradition from Piercarlo Talenti of um, that the work of the year starts out with a salon where um, each playwright brings in two experts and we just get all of these ideas on the table and like it's an orgy of um, intellectual activity and imaginative excitement, and I love that as a bright spot. Another really quick bright spot is, like, I think that the um, world premiere is losing its hegemony. Sorry, I couldn't think of a less dropped interview way. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's power, yes. I like uh, getting Lauren talking about earlier about the Kennedy Center, commissioning her with a small amount of money to give a big idea before committing to anything else and also allowing the playwright think time and to pay for that. And, and as delegates, who's not in the room who could have been in the room as, as someone to be shouted out to? So like Kennedy Center is a perfect example. I think SCR's ability to commission a lot of playwrights at all different phases of their careers. With Kansas City Rep, we are going oh. through um, a massive process of trying to educate their development department and marketing department. Um, uh, and education department about devised theater and that process has begun super early actually before they'd even committed to the commission uh, about how to think about this work and how to talk about it with their audiences. Anybody who's producing mid-career playwrights that aren't new and shiny. Yeah. 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 That's the arena residency program. I love that. I love the idea um, not just from, from the National New Play Network of the 25 theaters doing sort of collaborative literary, literary management, but also Boston, the Small Theater Alliance of Boston does this for the fringe scene, and I think it's, it's going very well. Yeah. 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 Oh, shout out and some claps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Denver Center for commissioning and, and uh, uh, fostering a, a plethora of Latino voices, both in their season and producing their play. Sean and Deborah at Intersection for the Arts, who for years have been um, creating an environment where the people walking up and down the street in front of their theater, but also the people who are filling their seats, and um, they've been thinking about hybrid performance and different modes of theatricality for eons, and they're brilliant. I think people outside of the NNP network, they're still doing rolling premieres. Mm -hmm. The Foundry Theater for taking really exciting artistic risks and finding fantastic out-of-the-box ways in which to engage their communities with the art. The number of good playwrights and good works. We're circumventing all of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. Center stage for giving Warbridge a home this year. Um, Southern Rep uh, Theater and uh, new, new Theater in Miami for uh, persevering despite the loss of their homes this year. Mm. Coming to the end, no more bright spots? To... I like Aaron's idea of office hours. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm it's Aaron Carter's okay. office hours. <laughs> Amy, did you have one? I mean, I have people bright spots. Go. Does that count? Say I'm Ritha, Aaron. Uh, my experiences here were certainly bright spots. Mm. Coming out of literary. <laughs> a bright spot is being paid to write. Have a residency. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 that's almost. That has been life changing. All our play readers, unsung, good play readers. Um, also, those folks who are daring to commission really, really big plays and yeah. are, are asking for that still to kind of battle what the recession has done to some of our aesthetic. Yeah. And I would say uh, Denver Center and Ashland and ACT, who have been collaborating with Hedgebrook up to help fund our festival for women playwrights. There's a, an entry from online that says, the O'Neill's engagement of designers and directors with playwrights and the literary department is a bright spot. All right. Thank you all for all of your energy the last couple of days. We're going to go have uh, dinner now, and then we'll be back for this, um, to hear the work of plays that got Stuck at the gate, our heartbreak list is submitted by four of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah. The same level of the cafe, but through the glass doors, and there'll be staff members.